We're looking at scientific and engineering phenomena that can be modeled by a first order scalar linear equation. We're not even going to consider forcing terms, so the solution is just a constant times an exponential. When the coefficient is positive, that means we have exponential growth. When it's negative, that means we have exponential decay. So examples of exponential growth would be population dynamics. In this case, x of t would be the number of individuals in a population, idealized to take on real numbers instead of just integers. And in that case, you can think of 1 over x times the rate of change in x as the net per capita growth rate, which here is constant. Another example of exponential growth is the interest on a savings account or on a loan. So in this case, the coefficient a represents the continuous compounding interest rate. On the decay side, a very common application is radioactivity. So in this application, x would be the mass of a radioactive isotope, which decays over time. We also have pharmacokinetics, what they call first order pharmacokinetics, even though they don't use the word the same way we do. Um, in this case, X would be the mass or the concentration, depending on the formulation, of a drug that's in a person's bloodstream. And finally, on the decay side, we have cooling or heating problems. This usually goes with the name Newton. In this case, X would be the temperature of an object. The object is in a room or an environment at a constant temperature E. And then we can define a new variable Z to be the difference between X and E, the difference between the temperature of the object and its environment. And then Z satisfies a decay equation. Some terminology that goes with these different applications, you often see half-life or doubling time. So the idea is that an exponential solution or an exponential phenomenon means that the amount is multiplied by a constant over each time interval. So in the decay situation, we have the idea of a half-life t sub h. That's the amount of time it takes for the solution to decrease by a factor of one half. And you can plug it in and get a formula of negative log 2 over a. On the exponential growth side, the corresponding quantity is the doubling time, t sub d. And that's the time it takes to increase by a factor of 2. So after 1 TD, it's gone up by 2. But after 2 TDs, it's gone up by 4, and so on. Units are always important in physical problems. The derivative dx dt has the same units of x divided by the units of t. And so to make a times x have the same units, a must have the units of 1 over t, or 1 over time. Sometimes that's not a very convenient number to use, so we might use half-life or doubling time to specify a instead. Or you might see the characteristic time, which is just 1 over the absolute value of a. That's the time it takes to increase or decrease in the solution by a factor of e. So as an example from pharmacokinetics, we have caffeine. So caffeine pretty well approximate, is pretty well approximated by first order pK. And the half-life varies a lot, but six hours might be a typical value. So knowing the half-life, we could back out what A must be. So for six hours, that would be 
about negative 0.1 in terms of inverse hours. And then once we know A, of course we know the entire solution whenever we want, provided we also have an initial amount. Here's an example from cooling. You have a cup of coffee at 90 degrees and it's in a room at 20 degrees. You also know that after 10 minutes the coffee's at 83 degrees. When does it reach 60 degrees? So here X would be the temperature of the coffee and Z is the difference between the temperature of the coffee and the temperature of the room. Z satisfies an exponential decay. So we have two unknowns here, A and Z of zero. We are given Z at zero. The coffee is initially at 90 degrees, so Z is initially at 70. We're also given Z at 10. That must be 63. So if we put in T equals 10 and Z of 10 equals 63, then we can solve for A using a little bit of algebra. Now that we know Z0 and A, we know everything we want to know about the solution. So the original question is when does Z equal 60 minus the room temperature 20? So when does Z equal 40? So you put in 40 for Z and you can solve for T. So let me just make a point about the coffee cup cooling problem using a solution in MATLAB. So here I'm setting up parameters for the solution. So the initial temperature, the environmental temperature, the room temperature, and the temperature at time 10. And then as in the analytic form, we solve the analytic solution for the constant A by using the value of the temperature at time 10 and out comes the same value as before. All right, so if we plot the two data points that were given for the temperature, all right, so here there's uh, initial temperature and the temperature after 10 minutes. Here's the temperature of the room, right? When you're given two data points, it's just overwhelmingly tempting to draw the straight line through them in order to extrapolate, right? So that's a natural thing to do. But for cooling and for any other problem involving an exponential decay or growth, it's wrong. So the right thing to do is to draw the unique exponential curve that goes through those same two points. And you see initially the solution isn't much different, but after time they become very different. Of course, all of this looks even more natural on a log scale. So if we set a log scale in the y direction, then an exponential solution is just a straight line. Let's look at one last type of example. That's the continuously stirred tank reactor, although we won't actually be doing much in terms of reactions. So here we have a 200 liter tank that contains 10 kilograms of dye. Pure water is being added in at the rate of four liters per minute. At the same time, the mixture of water and dye is being drained at that same rate. The question then is how much dye remains in the tank after 10 minutes? So of course, in the very long term, you're just adding pure water and draining everything out. Eventually, it's going to be essentially pure water. And it's going to produce that at an exponential decay rate. 
So to answer the question, you first have to know that how much means the mass of the die. And we'll use mass as our independent or as our dependent variable. You can also use concentration as long as you're consistent, but I find mass easier. So the rate of change in the die mass, all that's happening is that stuff is flowing out. So you take the rate at which the mixture is flowing out times the concentration in that mixture, right, which depends on what X itself is at every given moment. And what you realize is it all just comes out to be a constant times X. And so this is, again, an exponential decay equation, which we can solve for X.